Hey guys, today I am talking with Dr. Greg Lehman. Dr. Lehman is a researcher, strength and conditioning specialist, physiotherapist, and chiropractor, and he is also the movement optimist. You are going to love this conversation, or at least I did. Dr. Greg is, he's an outside the box thinker, and when it comes to moving in pain, he is the movement optimist. He believes that, you know what, your body's tough and resilient, and there's a good chance that it can heal itself. I think you're going to enjoy this show. Thanks so much for tuning in. This is the Original Strength Podcast. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. So, Dr. Lehman, you're kind of like a superhero. Um, you're a researcher, a physical therapist, chiropractor, strength and conditioning specialist. And so you bring a lot to the table. Um, how, how did you, what's your origin story? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, it's funny when I was in high school, even in university, I was going to be a cop, like an RCMP because this, my uh, trampoline coach, when I was coaching trampoline, that's what he was. He taught trampoline and he was RCMP officer. And I was like, that'd be wicked. But then I started doing well in kinesiology and, uh, all the smart people were going to physio or chiro school or medicine. I was never going into medicine. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll do this. But then I, then I did a master's cause I didn't feel like I knew anything. And then I went to chiro school and then, uh, and I was in practice for years and I, I didn't really like the chiro profession, to be honest. <laughs> so you don't have as many opportunities as a physio. Uh, and when I was a chiro, I was a strength coach. Oh, yeah, I was thinking when I was in school, I was always a strength coach. I got, I would fall into it. My roommate was like the basketball, a basketball player for the Laurier university. So he's like, well, you'd be our strength coach. Everyone, everyone assumes that like you earn things. I'm like, no, you just fall ass backwards into most <laughs> opportunities. I swear. And then like my wife ran with uh, a really elite running coach. And then, so then I started treating a really elite runner who went to the Olympics. So I'm like his physio, but it's, it's not like I did anything. She, his coach just knew my wife. Like he, anyway, so that's my origin story. You just get lucky and you just follow through with the opportunities you have. Yeah. Well, I, I, that, that is neat. And I do like, I totally get falling into things. Um, that seems to be, you know, doors just seem to open and you, you go through them. Um, totally. And, and it leads to a new adventure. But one thing that you have, well, the route you seem to be taking is you are, and this resonates so much with me, you're a movement optimist. Right. What, what is that? What is a movement optimist? Yeah. So I coined that because it was more of a reaction to the, it's more of a reaction than anything else and than an initial idea. It was like, it's a reaction to the kinesiopathological model of like injury uh, and function. And that model is sort of this idea where you have a small bandwidth of how you can function. You know, if your knee caves in a little, uh oh, that's a problem. If your shoulders hike, if you round your spine, all of these ideas that we have, uh, you know, the only way to train you, the best way to train your core would be make sure you get like the deep core muscles to fire first and all of those things, all these rules that we have. And I'm like, forget about that. Like, we have an amazing variety of options and how we can move. Like, why are we so negative with the body or like what, why do we use terms like wear and tear? Are you going to break down with you? So you have to protect it or review the spine is fragile. And I'm like, the spine's robust. Humans are robust. We got to load shit up and we'll adapt. So that's the optimism idea. And I'm just, and just confronted with that. You see, you see this all the time. I, I, like people can have massive amounts of scoliosis and they're going to the Olympics for, for swimming or they're lifting five times their body weight in the deadlift, right? Like that, the optimism is there. You just have to choose to see it. No, that, that is, yes, that's perfect. Uh, so which brings me to a question. You're talking about moving and pain and having to have a specific form and or specific patterns. Does, does pain mean that there's damage in the body? No. Like no, not at all. That's what's so frustrating about pain. pain. Pain, if anything, like we use key messages like pain is more about sensitivity rather than damage. Yeah, sometimes when there's damage, you'll have the healing response requires chemical sent like chemicals to be released, and that's what kind of hurts. You know, like you can have a paper cut, that's damage. You don't know, but you go and uh, you know use hand sanitizer, and it hurts like mad right? That's like a disc herniation. You can have a massive disc herniation and you don't feel it, even if it's pressing on the nerve root, but disc herniations, they often hurt. Like one aspect would be because 
it, it, the, when the disc material comes out, the body has no idea what it is. It's foreign to it. So you have this neuroimmune response, you have this chemical sensitization, and then people get so freaked out and afraid, that's where the brain gets involved. And, and now you have even more pain because then you start moving, you stop moving, and then you're worried about it, and then you ruminate, and then you, you fan that kernel of pain from your back and you turn it into like a bonfire. And that's pain in a nutshell. It's like the tissues involved, but so is everything else in your life. So, which is pretty neat because like most people don't think about, well, pain doesn't necessarily mean damage, but also damage doesn't necessarily mean pain. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or it's hard what we describe. So maybe often our issues is what we describe as damage. Like you can have tendinosis. So it's like a change in the quality of the tendon. You know, they would have called that tendonitis before. And so is that damage or is that just like a change in how the tissue was? Like, it's not ideal. So, I mean, or you can have wear and tear, like changes in a joint. I don't know if that's damage, but it doesn't look the way it looked, you know, when you're 15. When it was brand new. So that's the issue. Yeah. I mean, but those, that, that the interesting thing is our, like our tendons and our joints are changing in our teens anyway. Most, that's when you kind of start to have these changes. So like, maybe that's what we need is just a revisiting of what we call these things. Don't call them damage. Don't even call them, like we call it degeneration. And maybe that's not even the right word. Maybe it's just a normal change. And sometimes it predisposes you to more pain, but it's not sufficient for pain. So you mentioned, you mentioned fear sometimes exasperates the issue. Um, yeah. Why, why, why do you think we are so afraid of pain and how does fear of pain make pain worse? Yeah, so mechanisms wise, we, we, we don't we don't know like the, the research would just and here's the, here's what's great. So we call it kinesiophobia, which would be like the fear of movement or, you know, fear of agony. So it might depend on the fear. What I personally think is like fear and worry. Uh, what, mechanistically, what they probably can do is they can probably sensitize the nerves at the tissue level and at the spinal cord level. So you have like normal tissue irritation, what we call nociception and fear some way changes our physiology and this, this pain apparatus. So it amplifies things. But I also think what fear might do for a lot of people, it's, it, it, it stops you from doing things that you need to be doing, right? It stops you from doing the healthy things. Right, so it, it, it will stop you from bending your spine and twisting and going out with your friends. And so if you just get into this cycle of less and less activity, you're not challenging yourself anymore. And that's sort of the idea. It's a, it's a barrier to doing things that your body and your nervous system wants. So it's probably like twofold there. Probably does something physiology wise, which we don't know. We just have like studies where like people who are in pain and don't recover that well, they tend to have more kinesiophobia. Whereas people who recover better have less pain. So the, the question is like, well, maybe, I mean, if you want to be like technical, you could say, well, no, no, no kidding. They're afraid of pain. They have all kinds of pain. <laughs> like if you get rid of pain, then they wouldn't be afraid. So that would be a reasonable argument against me. So it's, 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 it's difficult. Any, anything in the pain world, we all, because I think you can recover and still be afraid of pain. Like, it's yeah that's what's great about the biopsychosocial we we blame things and we forget how robust we are i mean you can be afraid you can be a catastrophizer like i am and you can be pain free you don't always have to get rid of the pain to do the things you love it's just one little thing that might not be ideal so given that then the fear of pain or just the complexity of pain is it safe to do activities when you hurt or, you know, if you're avoiding an activity because you do hurt, so then you move less and less and less, you know, is that, that doesn't seem like the way to go either. Yeah. So this is where, like, you don't want to have a blanket statement and say, oh, absolutely, just move when it hurts. This is where you, you have to be a good clinician or work with someone who's a good clinician. You have to understand why someone hurts, right? And if you can figure out they're safe, like, you have to know that there isn't really some tissue structural damage. You have to know that this isn't some vascular issue where a surgeon needs to come in. You have to know that this isn't like a joint that keeps dislocating and surgery is the right thing. So you still want to do like good clinical tests because sometimes tissues really matter and pain is a good indicator of what's going on and you might need help. So you got to understand that. 
But then other things like tendinopathy, you know, joint changes, joint degeneration, we know like it, it's safe. Pain is not the best indicator of what's going on. You're allowed to poke into pain. You know, I use stupid expressions like poke the bear, don't hump the shit out of it. Like, you know, you, so, sometimes you, you, it's safe. Like I have pain every day, you know, and I've had it for like 20 years. It moves around. Some days are good. Some days are bad. And I just modify what I do. Like if I waited to be pain-free, I would never do anything. Like I can go skateboarding later. It'll hurt at the start. I'll hurt later, but whatever. I'm fine tomorrow or it's back to baseline. So it's, it's sort of that. And we know that like with athletes, not athletes, anyone who's active, um, uh, if they have joint, if they have tendinopathy in their ankles, then their heels might hurt or their Achilles might hurt while they're doing it. But that's okay. Keep doing it as long as you don't have a big flare up tomorrow. Same with joint degeneration. So it does. It doesn't usually matter. Yeah. So I've been in the last couple of weeks. Like I've had this thought. Like, well, you know, don't be afraid of pain. And then I was like, no, don't be afraid to live. So it's kind of like yeah. it's kind of like what you're saying is don't necessarily be be afraid to live. That's the idea. Understand what's going on. Like I, I use expressions like pain gets a seat at the table but it's not allowed to be the CEO or the dictator, right? You listen right sometimes, understand. I mean, and there's a subset of people who like, who are, we call them endurance copers, meaning they keep hammering and hammering into pain. And they, maybe they think no pain, no gain. So there is a subset where we would say, maybe you should back off, take a little bit of a, you, you, you need to settle down a little. You're maybe doing a little bit too much. <laughs> maybe you should be a tiny, not afraid of pain, but listen to it a little bit more. So there are, there are some people. Yeah, but I would say most people, yeah, yeah. If, if they're avoiding and not doing the things they love again because of pain, that, that would be a reasonable first step to start doing the things that living again is huge. So you just said a few minutes ago that you think we forget how robust we are. And yeah. I, read, I read a statement from you where as a, a clinician, you, you don't want people to become dependent on you to think that they need you to heal. You would rather they learn how amazingly resilient their body is and capable it is to restore itself. Can you speak yeah. on that a little bit? Yeah, it's actually probably a limitation of mine as a therapist. Like I think I might, I probably see people too like few times, like I don't see them enough because they might, if I say, oh, you can do this on your own, they might think I'm being dismissive and all that. So if, if you do practice like me, I will say to you, like, it's okay to see people a few more times just to make sure, like, I, you know, it's, it's all right. No, because if we are robust and resilient, it means we're not going to like fall dependent on a therapist because we saw them five times instead of three. So, or eight times instead of five. So it's okay. Like I got to listen to my own words here. Uh, so all that means is like, it's more when I was really a manual therapist, a lot more manual therapy, and I would have colleagues seeing patients two to three times a week for months, and people, as soon as they would have any aches and pains, they felt like they had to go in and get something rubbed or manipulated and all that stuff. So it's a reaction to something to the extreme where like people just, we, we can develop some, we need to develop in ourselves, like when you have pain, these coping strategies or accepting that some pain is, is, is okay. And not feeling like some therapist needs to fix everything that's going on because they're, they're probably not right <laughs> your money sometimes you mentioned too about how we fall victim sometimes to rules um like don't do this or yeah. if it looks this way it must be bad so given that how how important is things like perfect posture or perfect alignment, perfect, you know, what it, does perfect movement even exist? Yeah, I think, I think at, for a performance level, and this is where good coaching is helpful, you can figure out the, a, a better movements to produce force or be the most efficient. So like there, there's coaching skill acquisition. Like I do lots of trampoline and gymnastics and skateboarding and like there's better ways to move to achieve the task. So that's where like movement matters for performance in terms of injury that's where we have like a, a lot more options here you can move you can be slouched and you can be totally fine and you know it's not a big deal you can lift with a really rounded spine and be totally fine it doesn't have to be you know less flexed uh, and the idea would be as long as you slowly build yourself up you can tolerate all of these different postures and we see this, you see it in sport every day. Like someone says you have to sit up straight. 
you know, and then I'm like, well, how do people row? <laughs> how do people play rugby? You know, how do you play football when you get in those positions? You've got like, it just doesn't make any sense. How do you ride a bike? <laughs> like, it's these, all these sports require you to be bent forward. So we're so illogical, yet we, you know, we want people to bike ride and do all these things. And yet we freak out because they sit at a desk and they're slightly hunched forward. <laughs> it's like nothing. So be flexible with the rules or take them with a grain of salt then. Yeah, I mean, and then the obvious thing, if, if it hurts when you're slouching and slumping all day, yeah, okay, it'd be reasonable to get a stand-up desk or to a lumbar support, you know, just do something different. But at the same time, if it hurts when you're sitting upright all day, then maybe slouch and put your feet up on the desk. <laughs> like it's, we make it so much harder than it is. Right. Or don't even worry about your posture at all. Go do something else. I like that one. <laughs> Get out of the house and climb a tree. Yeah, like whatever. So I got to ask you, you're, you're extremely active. Um, and you like to, to, you mentioned the trampoline. So, and I don't, yeah. I don't talk to a lot of people that often get on the trampoline. So I got to ask you why the trampoline and what is it about it that you love? So the tramp, like, so I, I do go to adult, or I used to go to adult drop-ins before uh, uh, COVID. And I was trying to do a lot of stuff on the hard ground, like round off back handsprings and backflips. And it's like, this is, this is the problem. Like I am a movement optimist, but there's only so much load you can handle before you really start to ache. And for me to get better on the ground, I had to train a lot, but I was training like four to five days a week and it was just too much for me to handle. So I heard more, but I needed to train that much in order to get better. So on the tramp, it's easier. Like it's just, it's not as, it's, it's easy. You can train two hours and, and you're fine and you're not, you're not too sore and you can, and I like to get skills. Like I want to learn a double backflip on a tramp or a backflip with a full twist. You can like practice for an hour and a half and you're fine but on the floor like doing back handsprings my wrists would just I do like 50 of them my wrists are killing but I needed to do that many to get better so that's why I do the tramp right yeah. it's just it's just easier <laughs> and I'm lazy it does all the work for you so well and that, that does make sense because it's a lot more forgiving uh than a hard floor would be too so I guess you can get a lot more volume and train your vestibular system yeah. and all kinds of things yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and, and you see this in gymnastics now as well, like traditional gymnastics with young girls and boys is like 30 to 40 hours of training a week in a gym. And now I think you're seeing a lot more enlightened, enlightened uh, coaches like shift movement science with Dave Tilly, where we're like, well, maybe you're just in the gym for 15 to 20 hours, still a lot, but you can do other things like strength training that, that'll carry over. It's got to be, it's so, so this part of movement optimism is just being smart with the loads and know that you can train a lot of different ways and it'll carry over and help your, help your sport or whatever your goal activity is. So speaking of that, being, uh, being a movement optimist and being smart with the loads, do you think that, does every, does everyone need to lift weights to be stronger and healthier? Yeah, that's the one thing that's actually, I, in my course, I talk about that. Like how, when are there times where we need to be very spiff, specific? Because I want us to just be general, like as long as you go for hikes and walks and do things you love, that's enough. And then, but then I wonder, especially for things like bone density as we age, you know, if if we have to be a little more specific, like you would need something like hopping, daily hopping, like where it's just higher impact, or to prevent like muscle loss, if you need some sort of heavier resistance training, where you might not get that from just walking or even just being on a trampoline. So that I, there's some specific conditions where I think we need to be maybe a little more specific. And the, the two, the big ones would be bone density and muscle loss with age, but that'd be, or, or if someone has the tendinopathy, that's the kind of the debate, like, and say they're a runner and like, can you just modify their running and then, you know, take away speed and hills, but then reintroduce them. And that's the stimulus for that tendon to adapt and get stronger and all those things. Or do they really need heavy, heavy resistance training to make that tendon stiffer and stronger? It's an, I tend to do both because I don't know, but I'd love to know for certain. <laughs> I mean, so, so you don't have research on that just yet? I, so no one does. Like, and I, I, that's one of those questions I go try to see and I'm be like, it's one of those ones where I, you just, I think you just cover your bases. That's why I like the minimum effective dose research where to maintain strength, you can like 
get by with, you know, three sets a week in total, as long as they go close to failure, I guess, pretty amazing. Just do like some heavy squats twice a week, some push-ups twice a week, you know, some pulling twice a week and maybe a lunge or a, a hinge or something like that's awesome. I love that research. I love that too, because it can be very simple. And it doesn't have to be grueling or break you down to accomplish what you really need to live your life well. Yeah. Yeah. And then public health wise, it's great. You can have simple equipment in a community center. And my daughter makes fun of me because I do a lot of seven minute workouts. (laughs) Like I'll just go in and do a trap bar deadlift or uh, lately I've just been doing something that's just funny. I'm doing bicep curls and shoulder (laughs) raises. It's just maybe for hypertrophy thing she's like what are you doing like she does an hour every day my daughter's committed and i'm like no i just went to nine minutes it's enough sometimes it is enough like i i am throughout the day i may do four or five five minute workouts like that yeah okay good i'll tell her about you good no i think it's perfect and it and to me i have a i have a somewhat of a solid rationale for why that to me it just it makes a lot of sense that that would work Versus trying to compress yeah. everything in an hour and hope for the best to me. No, I just get bored in an hour. I'd rather go bounce on a trampoline or go rock climbing or something like that. You know. So, so to me, though, to days. me, you, you, it's for you, it's like the call of the wild, though. Like it's almost like you want to honor your body's design and, and go do those things. Like, so, so I don't know, it just resonates with me. Um, like I totally jive with your style um, and your message. Yeah, it's just more fun. <laughs> more fun. <laughs> exactly. It. It's more fun. So you have a wonderful uh, YouTube page that I, I think would just be, a, I don't know, a blessing for people to, to check out. Where, where can people find more information about you, your material, uh, your research, and, um, and your courses? So my website's just greglayman.ca. And the best thing I have on there, I mean, it's a bit of a mess because it has my courses, it has blogs, but Right on the front page, it has my pain workbook, which is just a 70 page book about pain and injury and rehab. And that's free. So that, I think that's the best resource I have. Uh, and then I have an, a page called OA Optimism, which I always forget about and I never promote. It's a free uh, resource for people with knee and hip OA. Just a, you know, three to five minute videos. They're also on YouTube. They're hosted on YouTube, of course. Just explaining the disease and things you can do, and then basic exercises. And of course, there's five to ten minute uh, exercise videos you can do as well. No, Again, I'm not I, trying to make it complicated. The the uh, OA optimism. I, I think that those videos are fantastic. Uh, really, oh, really thanks. well done. Yeah, I gotta do gotta do more. But that, actually, I. I don't really want to do more. The point is like, we don't need anything special or new. Just do some squats and lunges and calf raises and that's it. Like you're just, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, you know? Uh, and so that's where most of my stuff is there. And on Twitter, that's where I mostly engage online, not Facebook. It's too much of a cesspool. Uh, <laughs> actually, except for skateboarding, there's a really nice community of like old people who skateboard on Facebook. <laughs> so, so if you could... If you could share a, a message with people that are maybe struggling with pain or um, even fear of of degeneration um, or growing older and the changes that are happening, what, yeah. what would it be? This is the thing. Look at the way you look at these changes in your joint is they they are going to happen no matter what you do. They were determined to happen when you were born. They're primarily genetic, right? So it's not a wear and tear disease. It's not because you did too much when you were a kid or you fell off your bike or something like that, right? And so What exercise, physical activity, a healthy lifestyle, a a healthy, like being optimistic about it, those things help you cope with these normal changes that everyone gets, right? You, you, You can't make the degeneration worse. Like if you have hip osteoarthritis, going for a bike ride isn't gonna make that joint grind away. It's not a bridge, it's not a car. Like, but for, we treat it that way and you still see papers and that's not really, really true. And so exercise and exercises won't build up the joint stuff either, but it'll, it'll build up your system to cope with that. Right. That's the thing. It's about, it's about coping and know that like, it's not weird to be in pain. Right. My wife has these friends who are all in their forties and they've been running for 30 years and everyone thinks, oh, you guys are so lucky. Like you, you must feel fantastic all the time. You got no aches and pains. And they're like, no, that they just keep running because they love it, but they all have something going on. They just work around it. 
it's the opposite of what what people there's nothing special about them except for their mindset and their way they cope they'll run less that week or run more the next they just figure it out ladies and gentlemen dr greg layman movement optimist and living advocate dr layman thank you so much for being on the show this was fantastic oh thank you it's my pleasure nice to meet you thanks for listening everyone now get outside and play